All right. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today with uh, David Leach. Um, he um, has begun David Leach Architects in uh, 2016, and uh, it happened after 13 years of working in several European offices, including Herzog and Demiron in Basel, Switzerland, Caruso, St. John Architects, and Six Day Architects in London. And Depeo Architects in, and Grafton Architects in Dublin. Um, the practice is currently engaged in public and private uh, works, including houses, housing offices, and gallery projects. And um, although it's a new practice, the work uh, of the studio has been published widely in books and journals, such as Domus Journal, um, Casabella Architects Journals, and other um, very well known sources. So I'll let you now uh, speak for yourself and yeah, introduce you and continue with the lecture. Thank you so much for joining us and for accepting uh, the invitation. Great. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation and, and for the introduction. Uh, it's very nice to have the opportunity to uh, stop when you're in practice and put together a presentation because enables one to reflect on the work we're working on and gives us an opportunity to pause and, and, and to think about it again. Uh, the title of the lecture was uh, First Thoughts, and I guess the reason I've called it that is because, as you mentioned, we're, we're a, a new practice. I, I, I tried to set up, I think, in 2016, but the reality was we didn't really set up until 2018. Uh, it's working for other offices up until then. So we are uh, a, a young practice, I think, quite a, a very new practice, and I guess in some ways, these are our first thoughts, uh, but similar to how when one is at university and one is working on projects in your thesis, uh, we are at the moment in the office trying to formulate what our interests and what our approaches to architecture, similarly to how I think when I was in university, I remember trying to think about, well, I'm getting all these inspiration and all these influences, but, but what are my interests and, and, and what do I want to be and, and, and uh, what do I want my architecture to be? And, and, and I don't think there is uh, any right answer. Uh, but also, I also don't think really there is actually anything as, as, as a first thought. Uh, I think that in architecture, it's really, it's, it's con continuity of ideas, be they the built memory, uh, and it's of thoughts and ideas that went on in the history, like in the history of architecture, but even before that, in the history of building, uh, as, I, as an architect, I find it really assur reassuring that the conversations that I think I'm having in my practice with my colleagues here and the ways we're working and, and ways we're thinking about atmosphere and communication. Uh, these are uh, universal and have been kind of talked about for, for hundreds of years. And this kind of first slide, I think, demonstrates that it. It, it was for an exhibition that was or organized by the Architecture Foundation here in London with Drawing Matter Archive, which is an archive in Somerset, where they asked a group of architects to respond by building a model to some of the drawings that they had in their archive. Um, I was given this drawing on the left by uh, Bartolome Antofantin, and it's a planned drawing of, uh, of I guess, what is, is, is a military camp. And our reaction, our response to it was what this model is on the right-hand side. And the model, in some ways, I think this is how we work often with uh, continuity and how we work with history, but because of just your position, how it works with these influences, it, it's always going to be a translation. And that translation is the important part of the architecture. That is not, uh, it's not necessary uh, dictation or recopying or rehashing, but somehow just because of the, the different lenses that are around us, be they contextual, be they political, be they just sustainable, be they about equality and diversity, these lenses, naturally will lend us to have to look again about how we uh, work with things and then the skill of the architect is in how we then one translates. Uh, this is uh, a villa by uh, Palladio, it's called the Villa Sariego in the Bonato in, in, in Italy. It was built in, I think it was 1570 or, or around then. And why I'm interested in it is because in architecture, there's obviously primary functions and secondary functions. But how architecture works isn't just simply, I think, to house or to uh, inhabit a function. But for me, architecture is also a means of, of communication. Uh, 
architecture is a, is a way of, of, of telling a story and it's a way of uh of uh influencing how one responds to environment or around them uh in our office we never really judge things in uh from an architectural concept or an arch intellectual uh, architectural point of view instead we always judge, judge things and make decisions on the experiential because we find that the emotion is probably more important than the intellect but what i want to show this uh, project by palladio is because it, it shows quite well the means of how something can communicate and how it can communicate at different levels to, to different people. So this is a, a villa, as I said, in Venato. Venato is still, I guess, a, a rural part. It's quite close to uh, Venice in northern Italy. But here, Palladio has made a, a, a building, and by its form and its expression, or, or its, uh, sorry, by its form and its, its figure, you can read it as a palazzo. You know it is a loggia and then there's wings that is a fine house of a certain scale. But also there's an ambiguity in, in how Palladio has then built this house. At the same time as it being uh, in the form of a palazzo, in terms of its language, there's much more of, of a cruder or rougher expression. And this is also symbolized in the statue of Diana and Apollo, which is to the front, uh, which are these uh, uh, Roman gods, one being of the, associated with the rural and the life of farming and hunting, and the other being associated with the urban and the life of the uh, more civilized life uh, uh, of the city and of, uh, of, uh, of the intellectual pursuits. But what I like about this building is that Plato isn't just uh, making a building that's diagrammatic, but instead, by the use of the language of the material, it starts to convey something else. And these two messages in this building are almost con contradicting. So you have the, the figure of the finest, the palazzo, but you have this very crude, almost, uh, almost uh, exaggerated uh, material expression of how the columns and how the building is, uh, is described. Palladio made these columns, uh, which almost look like a giant has come and picked these stones out of the garden and placed them one on top of the other. The reason for this is that Palladio was trying to relate in the tectonic an idea of the rural and the more primitive and the idea of the primitive hut. But then in the figure and the, and the scale of the city, the idea of the building as a typology of the palazzo. Uh, this is a conceit. Uh, there is this contradiction that allows this kind of ambiguity. So potentially for uh, the people in the surrounding area, they understand this house in relation to the maybe the more farmyard or barn-like uh, uh, structures that are more associated with their life. But then to the visitors who are coming from the city because of the form, they relate to the grandeur of the palazzos that you have in the city. Uh, but Plato has, this is an uh, accident, Plato has done this purposely, he has get, gotten these stones and you can see how he's chamfered them so that like they look like being picked up massively from a garden and placed one on top of the other and that they're bearing down on each other and there's this weight and this heaviness and this kind of almost tactility to, to these, these calm like giant order. Uh, the conceit is that reality this sort of work would have been, this sort of column would have been more expensive to make than those more urbane, finely fluted columns that you've seen in the other palazzos of, of in Vicenza that Plato was making. So he's making this simply to give the illusion or to give the impression of something that feels crude and rustic. The reality of it is there's more cost, there's more expense in doing that because he feels that it's important that this way of communicating is important in, in the architecture that he's doing. So I guess the question is, why do this? Why did Palladio do this? There's no practical benefit to this. What is it in terms of the architecture, in terms of the emotion that he was trying to convey? And that's something that I was interested in in, in, in my architecture. How can it maybe work for a user, but then also have a responsibility to a visitor, which might be different than the user, and then a responsibility to a passerby that might be different to those other two as well. So this is an installation by the artist uh, Fischli and Weiss. Uh, Fischli and Weiss are Swiss artists, and in the 1980s and 1990s, in many of these, uh, a series of these kind of installations, this one's from the Tate Modern in 2001, uh, the installation appears to kind of display 
everyday items that might be left over from the artist's studio, sort of kind of as found a collection of old roller brushes, paint cans and boxes. Uh, however, the reality is that these aren't things that have been left behind by the decorators or, uh, or the artists in the, in the gallery. Instead, these are all hand-carved miniature sculptures and hand-painted that have been made from polyurethane to look like everyday items. And this, for me, is interesting because <laughs> there's an illusion of the mass-produced items within the artist studio, and this illusion is asking many different things. It's asking the question, what is an actual artwork? Is artwork uh, the process of making, or is artwork the actual artifact itself? It critiques art history and the ready maze of uh, Duchamp and Bois, but it also is a critique of the idea of process versus the finished architect art, artifact. Uh, it, uh, Peter, Peter Fishley described these elements, these pieces of these objects you see in this art installation as phantoms. Uh, and I like that word phantoms. Uh, and phantoms is something that we kind of take forward in, in our architecture. But the reason he called them phantoms is because they're there in their visual terms, in terms of in terms of what they communicate, but actually on a closer inspection or when you go to touch them, they're not there. The reality of them is it, 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 it isn't uh isn't what it appears. But for me, that asks an important question. And that's an important question about architecture. What is more important? Is it the reality of the architecture or one's perception of the architecture? Uh, in the building, I think it's the architectural idea versus the architectural experience. And as students, I think that's useful because in university, you're constantly being asked about the architectural idea. You don't get a chance to build. So it's hard to kind of to draw out the, the, the contrasting view of what the architectural experience of that idea might be. Uh, and in, in my teaching and with my students, I always ask that when they're judging something, when they're making a plan or when they're making a section, they don't judge their buildings on these abstract uh, drawings or abstract methods, but you always instead go to make a perspective or experiential image, rather be a drawing or be it a model. And then from that experience and from the uh, conveyance of the materials around them, use that to judge how to move forward. Because I believe actually the experience as it is an emotion is more important than the intellectual construct of the architecture. Uh, this is a project we did, uh, one of the first projects we did and finished in 2018. Uh, we've only built uh, four projects. So I'll show two tonight and two projects maybe tonight. Uh, uh, the last two have just been finished this year. Uh, and we're hoping to go inside with another one at the moment. But you can see we're, we're, we're quite small. But this conservatory room is really, uh, I think, this architectural maybe version of an architectural phantom. So this is a building that was built uh, quite cheaply. It, 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 it's a very small project. But what was interesting for us because of budget and because of financial constraints, but also uh, desires from the client and project requirements. This is a wall building, so it's made up from walls that's pretending to be a stick building. Uh, it is cheaply made garden room and in its articulation and its kind of uh, and its making, it alludes to stick building and the filigree constructions of uh, the conservatories that you would see in many, many Edwardian rears of gardens of Edwardian houses. Uh, these conservatories were too expensive for our client to buy and to build and sticks was too expensive for our client to afford. But that impression or that, uh, that uh, atmosphere of this filigree orangery as you'd have in, in the Edwardian times was something that we wanted to convey in a more inexpensive and, and cheaper way. To do this, we looked in their offices, this idea of what we call richly economical. Uh, this means like trying to build cheaply with materials that a lo local job and builder can use, but trying to assemble them in a way that is more controlled. And that's by done by design in the office so that all the items of this project that could be bought off the shelf, like uh, roof lights, windows and doors, anything that was standardized and proprietary, we would buy. But in this project, anything then that we had to assemble, for instance, the blockwork walls or the joists, 
we would put our effort into how they could be assembled and we put our design effort into how they'd be assembled. So the block work, depending on how it was laying, either laying flat or in soldier course or laid stretcher, started to uh, form articulation. And then with these pilasters, we were starting to talk about how one could, uh, although it was a planar structure, one could allude to uh, individual frame-like structure, even though these aren't actually frames. And then with the joists, we were interested in, well, what instead of just simply spanning the joists across the walls, if instead we would span them diagonally across the walls, that the joists could become more than just a necessity to hold up the, uh, up the ceiling, but in fact could give a character and uh, an image to the room, which might allude to the image of the conservatory or a, figure, figure, a, figure, a, a filigree building. Uh, importantly, the idea with uh, building cheaply is that the best way to build cheaply is with tolerance. And tolerance means that you can't strip back and then just expose structure because you're not letting the builders or you're not letting guys inside have any wriggle room for mistakes. So the idea with richly economical is that we use linings like uh, uh, what, like historically what designers and builders have used when they're making a skirting which was to conceal the gap between a, a floor, or sorry, a floor and a wall. But we started to really try to exaggerate that. So we became interested in linings, things like uh, plasterboard, plaster, uh, linings, timber, MDF, uh, even paint. Anything that would enable the sub the substructure or the su structure to be built quickly. Uh, and then anything that can see how truly this block work has been assembled. It's been assembled by a local jobbing builder, not particularly skilled. He can put them up very quickly, but then by enabling that to be uh, rendered over or plastered over, it means there's a tolerance. There's something that can conceal the mistakes that happened before. There's this kind of illusion, I think, in recent architectural discourse about if you want to build cheaply, you build with this kind of austerity chic where you strip everything back. But a, the reality with that is that you need very skilled makers and very skilled craftspeople then to put everything together because there's no tolerance. There's no anywhere for these uh for these structures to hide everything is exposed so there's no uh limit to uh it has to be perfect in the first uh fix but you can see here the structure with the uh block work and the the, the, the image of these filigree posts and you can see the joists gone in and where we needed insulation we're infilling with insulation where we needed roof lights we just took them away then you can see by then rendering over and then by using paint we're able to kind of almost with Left or Hyden's eyes from maybe some cruder joints, and the uh, render was able to kind of conceal any imperfections that were happening in the block work from before. And this is the garden room where it goes from outside, from inside to outside, and then the boundary neighboring wall. And when the wall arrives, the wall our wall can fall down, and then these pilasters become proper columns and the filigree structure on the outside where we don't need actually any insulation, so we can move away from these coffers. And again, it becomes more of a trellis-like structure, which eventually the planting would grow up and uh, form over. Uh, this is a photograph I took uh, probably a few years ago now, maybe towards the start of the practice. And I took this photograph, one in the first instance, I took it because I really liked this wall and I, I, it was quite close to a site I used to pass quite regularly. And I, I, I liked the uh, the composition of it, and so I I, I took a photo of this gable. But on reflection, uh, it, it kind of sums up a lot of how the way we work in the office. And the way we work in the office is, uh, I guess we believe in an architecture of gestalt. And uh, the word gestalt really means is, is where a project is made up of not a, a singular big idea. Like I used to always take that uh, question in university about like, what's your thesis? What's your big idea? I was like, I never had any big ideas, but instead I like to make my projects up with, with many small ideas. Sometimes these are cinegraphically placed of different types of experience through a building, but also they're just, it's an iterative process. Sometimes it's just uh, building up to design layer upon layer. I guess a, a good example would be uh, uh, a watercolor painting which is built up slowly and you know I uh, I don't know if I have a slide later on but the, the obvious is, is is Mark Rotko where he builds these kind of paintings that look like they're monochrome and when you get close to them you can see that they've been built up in many 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 layers 
and that layering adds this depth and this richness to the painting. So from a distance, they might seem like a monochrome um, idea, but on closer inspection and going closer to it, the, the picture in the painting reveals an extra depth. And what I like about that is that the building isn't diagrammatic. It doesn't give itself away in the first visit. It's only on the second or third or fourth that they start to come tease out the ideas that kind of went, uh, went before. This is the uh, second project we've built. We built this and the conservatory room at, at the same time. Uh, this is for a small house in, in the city of Dublin. It's actually just outside the city in, in, in a suburban area. Uh, I'll try to describe the project. It's a bit strange to me to describe a project like this, and it can seem a bit overwrought, I think, in lectures, because I try to describe the project in the, the various layers, like I'm stripping it back like an onion to each of the pieces. But uh, the idea is that this, again, project didn't have one singular idea, but it was built up in a, in a layer of, of, of these washes. And when you're in the building, when you're in the house, you hopefully don't experience it as this kind of multitude of voices, but uh just a singular whole the idea with gestalt is that the uh the sum is obviously greater than the parts so uh this is the site uh as i said it's just outside uh dublin city center it's in a typically suburban area kind of inner suburb and typologically the houses are these uh terrace houses that have a uh, small front and rear gardens uh, our site was actually part of the garden to this house, number 80 Hollybrook Grove. Um, the site was unusual in terms of that it was bounded on three sides by public space. You had uh, the main estate road, you had this kind of small public uh, plots in front, and you had this laneway to the rear that was a, 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 a one-way road to the main road that was running up here. Uh, interestingly, this uh, existing house was bought by a developer with the intent to build onto the site. Uh, the developer failed twice to gain planning permission on the site, uh, mainly because they were looking to take this plan, this the same kind of uh, uh, template, and to repeat it on the site without kind of trying to adjust or translate it from the existing precedent into something that might be more contextual to the immediate place. Uh, the reason why the planners uh, uh, reject the planning permission for those two occasions was down to outdoor amenity space. And this is something that then became this kind of draw, uh, problem, became one of the drivers for the design. Uh, it was interesting, the clients came to us and they told us about the previous planning applications. Uh, it was a different client than the one who the developer who owned the house that he sold on the site. And uh, uh, and when we went to visit, we kind of went into this garden and although it was wildly uh, overgrown, it had a kind of uh, quite a calm atmosphere to it. Uh, although you could see the existing neighborhood in the distance, it was somewhat uh, hedged in or hedged away by the existing vegetation overgrowth. And layering onto that, this then problem of the garden being the reason why the original plan applications weren't uh, approved, we kind of thought, well, if the garden is the issue or the concern, let's make a project that can be about the garden. So this project became a house and a garden. Uh, to do this, one of the first things we looked at doing was taking the house off the boundary wall with the neighbors so that the house could have a garden that could run around all four sides. But placing the, uh, the house more within the center of the site and then pushing up against the laneway. Uh, what we did on the ground floor is we looked to, uh, by pushing up against the laneway, it kind of gave us this polygonal form, which was uh, came about by the uh, constraints of the site joining up with the uh, boundaries of the existing building. But what we try to do is that we look to remove any structure from the exterior walls on the ground floor. And instead, we look to place the structure within a cross-shaped core. This cross-shaped core also divided the polygonal uh, shape 
into four public rooms. We had a, an entrance, we had a dining room, we had a kitchen, we had a living room. And then within the cross-shaped core itself, we then had ancillary functions. We had a, a WC, which was a literal bookcase. We had a storeroom. We had a stair in one leg. We had a kitchen in another leg. And then we had fireplace and storage in the other leg. Obviously, there's a reference to Louis Kahn on the idea of uh, served and servant spaces. Uh, but also, we're interested in trying to blur the ideas of, uh, of typology. We're interested in the idea in domestic architecture of the open plan. So rooms that are uh, not rooms, but are open and connected to each other at the same time. But we're also interested in the idea of the ROM plan and rooms that are separated and connected. Uh, so within this, we try to look at how the plan could develop. And if there was an idea, we looked at how we could develop this to something that became more ambiguous. We're very much interested in uh, Venturi in the office, uh, in his early works, uh, but also in his early built works, to say, but also in his writings, and in particular, uh, complexity, uh, contradiction and complexity. Uh, in it, he talks about uh, things being both and, and he talks about things being ambiguous, because rather than something being very uh, deliberate, and not, not deliberate is not the right word, rather than something being very obvious, uh, this idea of something being less, more vague means that it can be interpreted and it be read differently by different uh, users, a bit like how that Pitchley and Vice painting can, or installation can be read differently by different people. It can be taught it was a joke. It can be, uh, you can read up on it and you can find out more about the ideas of the as found. Uh, you can, uh, you can, there's just multiple inter interpretations and that's something that I'm interested in my architecture that there can be interpretations to it. So in, in this uh, house, uh, the reasoning of why the, the glass type structure came about wasn't just because, or sorry, glass like perimeter with a solid cross core, which I think you can see in, in oh, sorry, this diagram here. The reason why this came about wasn't forced on because we wanted to come split up the function of the room, but it came about by the driving idea from the planners that uh, the reason why the other plan applications were uh, uh, refused was the lack of private outdoor space, so the lack of garden for the size of the house. So our idea became, well, if there is an idea of a lack of garden, we should make the house always be about the garden and not just be about the garden in terms of a visual sense, but got rid of this glazed screen and a visual outlook onto the garden, but physically, and that the actual the idea between what is internal and the idea of what is external becomes ambiguous and becomes blurred. So it's not about this kind of cliched idea of the garden being brought inside or just that boundary, but a real blurring of what is inside and what is outside. So to get over planning, uh, concern with regard to the private outdoor meaning space, the idea became that what if we were to wrap the house in a, in a curtain of glass and timber and that on fine days, the curtain could peel back and this door also folds back here so that the house uh, isn't defined by the perimeter line of the glazed screen anymore, but by taking these, uh, taking these, uh, uh, screens back to the apexes of the cross, it becomes this cross-shaped pavilion in the garden. And the garden isn't defined by this line now anymore, but the garden is now all of this or all of this, and really becomes this cross-shaped pavilion within a garden. Uh, this is a, some images that kind of start to describe this with this timber and glass screen. It folds back. So that the idea of where the, uh, where the wall of the room starts to, to disappear. So in my mind, the wall of the room isn't defined by this line, but the wall of the room is defined by the boundary, the hedge and the boundary wall of the garden itself. So this is your house. And that also infected how one was to look at the language of the materiality. So in materiality, we looked at using these uh, concrete floor, which was alluded to the patio. So there's this ambiguity between what was considered uh, inside and what was considered outside. And it was 
even heightened further by how having the doors when they fall back to fall back into these apexes of the cross. So when one moves around the house, you're always forced to kind of step outside and back around so that you move around the house like this. Uh, and this uh, this kind of uh, this reading of this these walls now being part of an internal wall, it becomes explicit. Also, at the same time, while we we're developing the house uh, and we we're working on the construction drawings, we went to visit accidentally or coincidentally, I guess, uh, this house by the Smithsons. It's the Stockton House just outside London. And it was similar in size to our house. And obviously, it's a house that so had similar functions. But what we were intrigued about was how, within a small house, the Smithsons had used this section to start to define a hierarchy or to start to define a different character for the ground floor rooms. We took this back to our project and we were also interested in, in having this idea of how we want to have this ambiguous plan somewhere between the open plan and the round plan. But if we weren't to have any doors on the ground floor, we were thinking, well, if we could introduce this into the section. So could we use the section on the ground to perform this sort of uh, landscape or, uh, or topography, which one would mean that every room you went into would have a different uh, proportion and relationship to the horizontality of the garden around it. And then on the first floor, we were interested in the uh, in the idea of a verticality to the rooms that would have a different uh, character to the more public spaces and the glazed public spaces on the ground floor. Also with the plan, we were interested in this idea of, well, it, it's a small, uh, it's a small footprint, it's only 60 square meters, but we're like, we're interested in the uh, language of the train carriages and how one would circulate around this house, not from the interior, but just circulate around this house from the perimeter. And without having any of the doorways along these four axes, it meant that this circulation or this loop of circulation would be continuous. So in, in, in a way, it becomes a space that is, is, is never ending. And that we thought was interesting within such a footprint of a small house. Uh, this is just then a, a, a few slides that can go through that sequence from when uh, one steps in to this, uh, steps up in, in, into the, uh, the entrance lobby, which is uh, heralded by this bookshelf. And the reason we have a bookshelf at the entrance is it's almost like the name of the house. We're interested in how the, the books and the things the client owns will be a way of announcing their interests and the personality of the people that's in it. Also behind this bookshelf is, is, is some glass because the WC is behind this and it borrows light through the space, filter through the books. And it's a bit of a joke that, you know, if someone's actually in the bathroom, you can pull away the books and then suddenly they reveal it. And it was a bit of a silly thing really. Uh, but then you can see as one travels around the house, your relationship to the garden and the relationship to the different rooms change. So you, you step down into this uh, dining space, which is on grade with the garden. And the reason on grade with the garden is the garden has some uh, edible uh, planting from uh, lots of fruit and, and, and some veg, but in a very small space. But there's also this idea that there could be different relationships and different uh, connections, physical and visible, to the garden. So it will always be repeated. Uh, this is something that I think we talk about later on in the idea of the applied arts. And uh, I guess it's another kind of form of this uh, idea of the uh, richly economical, but we, where we're using elaboration, where we're using services, not in a way that is just applied to the architecture as a necessary uh, service to provide electricity, switches, et cetera. But we're using them in the manner of the applied arts, not for any extra practical purpose, but for uh, vis visual and uh, I guess emotive delight that they're arranged in a pattern that can come add extra interest. It may not be interesting to some people, but it might be interesting to some other people. And that's what we like the, the house to have these uh, small nuances in it. So as one travels, I'll try to take you around the loop. You step down to the dining room. Sorry, going the wrong way. And you right, right into the dining room. You then go around. Oops, wrong way again. Here, and you go around the, uh, the kitchen counter. This is that space uh, you arrived here, you step down here with doors folded back and you can see the language of this kind of patio with the light coming quite deep into it. Uh, and then this is how you step around back into the kitchen space behind here. You can see how the, 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 
boundary between or the, the, the perimeter of the house isn't a wall thickness it's actually just a line and we like how the garden actually and the, the shadow of the garden means that there is really this there is no uh there is no uh delineation between an exterior and an interior it becomes all one going from the kitchen you then step down to the north facing part of the house this is the uh living space with this fireplace you step down to change the proportion because it's north facing, trying to get more light into it, but also to change your relationship to the garden again. So in this space, the living room is sunken and the garden is, is raised up high. This is a smaller garden. It's not really about a garden, about going out to enjoy the sunlight or planting. It's more a garden that's about looking on out onto. Or there's a party on, you can potentially open up all the doors and you can have a cigarette and you can relax through it like that. Then from the living room, you take three steps further back up and you arrive back where you started. Other small kind of tunings, I think is probably a good way to call it. Was, you can see with the doors how they're not always the same, depending on if you're going to the most public part of the house, the, the, the horizontal boarding changes to kind of give you some protection. And then as you get to the more open private parts, it drops back, back down again. And there are some cues on how the doors or the entrances are, et cetera. Uh, of course, we're really interested in this outdoor, indoor ambiguity, but this is the uh, obvious uh, precedent from Le Corbusier and this rooftop apartment in Paris with the Eiffel Tower in the background. Quite like that, this reality kind of plays or twists your perception or counterbalances, or not counterbalances, almost off, unsettles how you could feel before. We like that in this house that like on an autumnal day, you can fold back the doors and you can have a fire on within the house. So within the house itself, you can be camping. And then where things are felt like they might be quite rough with this kind of very struck concrete, we then contrast that or we contradict that maybe then by painting kind of finely, uh, uh, just varnished uh, ornament onto the walls. And this ornament, is only visible when light hits it in a certain way because it's just painted with varnish. And then when the uh, light changes, it disappears. And again, this interest in how things can change, how things can be different perceptions. And then what is the reality and what is uh, what is your perception and how it does affect your emotions becomes important to us. When we're working in the office, we're not really just looking at the canon of architecture. Uh, Instead, we're really interested in looking, and I think that's really useful, is just be able to look at the, at the ordinary and and to balance that with the, the canon, canon like, and what's important is not that you just see something and you, re, you dictate it back again, but it's really the translation of that reference that's like, is, is important. In the office, we're really interested in everyday places, the language of the suburbs, the things that everybody knows uh we're interested in in high architecture obviously we we we, we like all the all, 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 all the greats but we're also interested in the in the in the ordinary and in the mundane and uh i think for us these things the, the high and the low are equally valid and there there isn't when i say low architecture i, I i'm not being in any way condescending i, I mean things that are just every day and i think it's by combining these together that you get things that are more interesting rather than simply uh constantly trying to strive for the novel uh, this is an installation by the artist joseph cossert i think it's called one and three chairs and what i like about it is that again he's asking to look at the ordinary but asking to look at it again and here in this installation how something is presented to you can make you look at something that you taught you knew so well and can make you look at it again in a new and a different light. You can see the chair here represented as a photograph of the same chair and then the chair again described in the text. And what I like about that is it's making us reevaluate and, and re almost take off your glass and kind of put them back on about what, what you think you know. And this is an early house by Venturi. It's called a Trubeck house. It's in a uh, it's uh, just outside on one of the islands uh, uh, off Long Island uh, in New York State. And what I like about it is in this house, Venturi is kind of using the elements of architecture that we know, uh, the window, the porch, the roof, 
but through exaggeration, he kind of makes it look a more punk version. Uh, I think a kind of like a, a good description of this for me is like almost like the kid in school who is wearing the school uniform, but like you know, the shirt might be a little bit un, 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 tucked out and the tie is a bit undone. He's part of the environment, he's part of the community, but at the same time, he's pushing back against it. Uh, what's great about Venturi is that he uses the elements that one thinks we know, like the window, but he uses them in, in, in a manner that isn't a window for looking through. This is a window for doing different things. It's a window actually that you travel up the staircase in and you can see behind it is another window. So it's like a window that's been making a layer to the space. He's using the elements and then using them in ways that are novel, but not just for that simple purpose. And what interests us in this is i guess it kind of goes back to the idea of, of the applied arts but it's again looking at elements that are are, are, are ordinary from pebble dash and rough cast but then looking at how one can arrange them and not really for any practical benefit like this is a house that's made from render this is a uh, contour house again but here we're using the render in in a rough cast way where we exaggerate it and here we're using the render hand trial smooth there's no practical benefit from changing them, but obviously there's an allusion to these earlier houses with these bandings and these uh, smooth reveals and a rough cast that we're trying to relate our project back to. We don't want our project to be the piece of, I guess, high architecture in the suburb. We want our, 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 our house to be part of the, the low architecture of the suburb and has to recognize that uh, there, was a, there was a tour of the house done for the uh, open house one one, one year and a lot of people passed by the house not realizing this is the house they wanted to go and see and they, they said that and to me that was like really that was job well done like i was quite happy that no one realized that this was the house that the architect had designed uh with the idea with the uh, applied arts is like looking about how one assembles things so here you can see the reference to wagner and the post office and how he holds up the cladding with these pins but here also in this roof, we had a very cheap fiber cement tile, but the crampion that holds a fiber cement tile, we got it and we oversized it. We, we took the flat end of it out so it become visible so that actually the fixing elaborates the tile and gives it another pattern or another layer of interest that, uh, that uh, we hope elevates it beyond just simply the, uh, the, the uh, banal. Uh, this is another example. It's by a sculpture by Bernard Lavier. Uh, it was in the Serpentine uh, uh, in Hyde Park, oh, maybe, I don't probably, oh God, probably 10 years ago now. But what I like about it, again, is that he's using elements of the everyday that we see all the time, in this case, garden hose. Uh, but how he assembles them and how he puts them together makes us reevaluate how one would use them. Here he makes them into this wonderful, joyous fountain. And this sort of use of the everyday I think is a very uplifting and, and, and really kind of quite delightful and, and positive way to work. And it's something that I really try to aspire to. So this is a small house that uh, actually this is one of the projects we're finishing this year. And it's a it's a small uh, extension. And here again, we're kind of showing you how we use elaboration to sometimes announce things that go on beyond the ordinary. Here it's a timber framed house that's been uh, clad in timber. In the areas of the house that are unimportant, we just paint it white. But then in the areas of the house, this is the one onto the garden, which I guess is the garden elevation has a, a primacy in the project. Uh, here, instead of just painting it white, we look to use introduced color and color, not just uh, singularly, but color different colors on different sides of the timber to start to play with the depth of the facade. So it's a timber clad facade, so it's quite thin. But then by painting the sides, depending on how you view it, the graphic goes from something that's quite planar, something that has depth. And we're interested in that kind of uh, contradiction between so, uh, a cladding that's seen as very thin, having the depth to it that's seen as being a bit more richer. Similarly, in this house, we had a ceiling that was to be held up. This is a house for an engineer. So the engineer, obviously engineers come from the world of economy, efficiency, uh, and uh, they never like to have uh, redundancy. So this project was almost a kind of a, a, a joke or a critique of that. So here, the uh, for the ceiling, we probably would have need four metsec joists to hold up this roof. Uh, but the metsec joists are relatively inexpensive. So instead of using the metsec joists to hold the roof and then plasterboard underneath it, we said, okay, well, what if 
we got his inexpensive choice and we really went for it. And we used 30 of them in the end to not just make a not just make a plane, but to make a roof that was both open to these uh, shop bought roof lights overhead that could filter the light down through. So a roof that was both closed uh, and a roof that was both uh, deep and open. And so by using this, there wasn't any practical advantage to it, but it was what gave the room its character. It gave it this breakfast room type atmosphere. Uh, similarly with the light fittings, again, we could have used one light to, to light this room, but instead we arrayed them in a pattern that meant that, uh, that, meant that the, uh, the ornamentation had both a practical purpose, like the, the idea of, uh, uh, of the uh, applied art and decoration and, and in, 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 in industrial design. Similarly, this is the bedroom back to that Clontarf Roadhouse uh, in Dublin, the house I was talking to with the cross-shaped plan. This is when we go upstairs, and this is the main bedroom. And here, as I said, we were, the roofs, these rooms were more in a vertical proportion. But here we use, we didn't just take from the eave to the uh, ridge line. We uh, cut the plasterboard so it could bellow because we wanted to give an impression almost of being within a tent because there's obviously references to Schinkel and that that kind of tent like architecture that he was looking at in those uh Charlotte Hoff. But we were also working on taking out the appropriateness of the atmosphere and the uh, emotion of be being within the tent and the calmness that gives for sleep. The applied arts can be seen in simple things like from the construction of a glazing bead, how a glazing bead can be exaggerated to hold the glass in. And then that this exaggeration of such a simple mundane item can be what gives a window its character and its kind of uh, impression when you see it. In the office, we talk about things as architectural homo homophones. Uh, homophones in obviously the English language are words that uh, are pronounced the same but mean different things. Like boulder, for instance, boulder versus boulder. Boulder can be to be more bold or boulder can be to be more rock. And I really like that in architecture, this kind of ambiguousness and, and this kind of uh, vagueness that you can do play with an architecture. And in this house in Clontarf, this is that laneway from the rear. Uh, we went from the kind of glassy world of the, of, of the ground floor to this more solid world. But here the homophone is this idea of a chimney. It's it, 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 in its image, it looks like a chimney and it actually acts as a chimney, but also it's this roof light that's lighting the deep dark, uh, the, the most deep part of the plan. So it's an extruded space that goes up to this roof light. And I like how uh, pieces of architecture can be uh, understood or used differently. That chimney is located here. This is the first floor plan of the same house. And as one arrives up, you kind of enter into this very tight and narrow space. And with only for having that extrusion up to that five meter high roof light, it might feel quite oppressive. But we're interested in the quality of this and that quality of what it would be like when you almost step into a wardrobe. And we lined this small room, it's two doors wide and one door in width. Sorry, two doors in left and length and one door in width. And from this, tall, narrow landing. We then have the bedrooms and the rooms that can peel off it. This is the stairs up to that space, this wardrobe-like quality lined up to two meters high. And then looking up to this roof light with a kind of guess, a bit of a James Terrell type atmosphere. Uh, these are the elevations of the house as it passes from the garden space to the laneway, back into the garden and to the front, front entrance of the house. Uh, And then this kind of dichotomy of the house that is some ways where we have the privacy pertained by the garden wall. It can be a glass house on the ground floor. And then on the first floor, it returns much more closer to its neighbors that are around it. So it can have this, this different impression, this different atmosphere. And you can see that here where we come, basically it's a house of two, two halves. You have this kind of glass house on the, uh, on the ground and this kind of idea of this prototypical modernist type Thing, and then you have the vernacular on top. But then within the estate, the house starts to feed contextually back and talk back to its cousins that are around it. 
albeit maybe a punkier version, a bit like that school kid with his uh, shirt on and tie hanging out. This is a photograph by Lewis Boltz. I think it's a explains well. He went around Irving in, in California, just looking at the everyday and how he, a bit like Kosot, uh, how he was framing his photography and made you look again at the simple things and made you think about, well, how things are ordered or how things placed here by accident or chance can actually be quite beautiful. And this is something that we took to our house. So where we had a laneway and we wanted to have a, a door and a window, which weren't possible because of planning. Instead, we made a blank door and a blank window. And then we used the downpipes to almost uh, like a line drawing or like a paint composition to, to kind of balance the, 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 the indents in the wall. Uh, I'll just go do one more project because I can see I've already been talking for an hour. Uh, this is uh, a project, it's, it's live in the office at the moment. It, it's for five houses. And it's uh, the reason I want to show it because it's, it talks again about the Clontarf house. And it's because I think first, first, thoughts, first, first thoughts are never really finished. Uh, so you, you might have an idea. And then that almost like a snowball starts to generate and to get changed. And as it rolls down the hill, it can get larger, it might pick up some bits that it wasn't meant to pick up. It might get knocked and fall. And, you know, things don't happen the way you planned them. And I think that's the beauty of working iteratively and working without a predetermined uh, idea or without something, uh, without a forced concept or architectural conceit. Uh, this project was developed from the cross-shaped plan of the Contour house. This is a planometric. Uh, I don't know if it's how clear. So we're looking from underneath up at the houses. These are the four houses, one, two, three, four. But you can see the cross-shaped plan now by if I put this cursor around it there and dividing the rooms into four and how then this has been tessellated out across the site. And in this case, this is a house for uh, this is a housing for, for a small developer. And he was interested in doing a house that could be adaptable. So that's someone when they go and see, you could see a house that they could buy. But then there would be the potential for this house to be modified. And it wasn't determined as a fixed architectural object, but there was cues in it to how they might develop it later on. So unlike the house in Clontarf, one of the, in the four quadrants here, going from my country, remember kitchen, uh, living, one of the quadrants is an outdoor space, and then you have the entrance. So the house has three indoor rooms and one outdoor room, which has this trestle uh, artist structure placed in above it. This room, this project also became an idea about having to make, uh, and it came from the plan of the Clontarf house, this idea of rooms that were neither inside or out. So we looked at that in relation to the whole site and we made this drawing because the interesting thing in this drawing is that there's no uh, determination or there's no hierarchy high between what is seen as garden space to us it's just a room or indoor space or I guess outdoor garden space again or garden space room and instead it's just a mat of rooms and some of these rooms are internalized and some of them are externalized. Uh, what we liked about that is that it kind of gives an equivalence uh, to the private outdoor space, but also to the public outdoor space. And when we were looking to, to do this uh, development, the first thing we looked at wasn't the buildings, but instead we looked at how we can make spaces between the buildings. What can the quality of these outdoor rooms be? Can we give something that can give work as a function, as a space for people to park, but also give back to the community? Uh, what kind of a laneway can it be more than just a, a, a means to get from one end to the other? It can actually be a place that people can be interested in. And we drew these drawings quite quickly on where we started to look about what the function of those spaces could be, from the gardens that you can maybe borrow a view from, to the car parking, which can also be something that might announce or herald the house is going on behind. So the alley and the courtyards became just as important as the houses itself. And this project was called an alley and courtyards. And we're hoping to build it maybe within the next year uh, or maybe longer probably. Uh, but then for us, as I said, 
when we first developing, we weren't developing the language of the buildings, we we're developing the language of the outdoor rooms. What could a laneway look like? How can it be terminated? Maybe could there be windows from a laneway into the other outdoor rooms of the housing? So could you borrow view and light from the private world into the shared world? How do you mediate between the public, the shared and the private? When you get to these very narrow spaces, what is the right dimension for an entrance into your house or an entrance into a neighbor's house that feels at the same time connected to you, but also separate to you? You don't want to just open your door and suddenly be revealed. But what is the right amount of space that kind of gives that pause for one to kind of get your breath before maybe going out and saying hello? How do we use the context to start to drive a figure or form that feels appropriate for a place without it feeling overbearing? How can that maybe that shape be somewhat subverted so that you know that it comes from this place, but actually it's something new? How does that look from not just the public world, but also from the private world? We're interested in how things are have a responsibility, not just to the users, but also to the people around them. And then this is the idea of this adaptable house. So this is that third room on the ground floor which has this uh, trellis, which is made up of these metric uh, joists, similar metric joists that you saw in the, uh, the house for the engineer. And then this is the living room on the ground floor and the living room on the ground floor has uh, no room above it in the first instance. Instead, there is this frieze of wall hangers, which alludes to a flooring that could be placed in there if at some point uh, the owners decided that maybe the house needed more space, they could roof over the trellis and that could become a, a room, or they can put into the floor joists and they can deck it out for maybe a potential study, or it can be uh, completely uh, filled in for a bedroom up above that's separated from the living space down below, or maybe the wall here can be removed so you get these rooms that are starting to flex and start to have different qualities that are and variations depending on how one uses them. We were we were interested though that when the house was first to be built, that this idea or that this trace of what could be a future is visible. So you might see some architecture where people have found as found buildings, and you know you can be say for instance in the, in the Tate Modern, and you can see what its history of the past was. In this version, we like that you know that the first floor, even though in this version there was no floor above it. The sockets and the light switches were in place and that the uh, joist hangers or the wall hangers were in place, but they were then used in this image as a, as a decorative element, as something that could be visually kind of like a trace of what a future could be. And then the doorway with its balcony only later on becomes a door with a doorway put, put into it or the joist hangers get used. Again, we are looking at the language of the suburbs and of the jobbing local builders merchants and seeing how we could use block work and how we could assemble a house from the or these ordinary elements. These are this uh, front or uh, rear outdoor room with uh, this uh, tr uh, trellis structure that can be roofed over or, or floored over. And then we were using glazing not as a way to, for view in or out, but a bit like Gary and Venturi were using glazing as a way to unitize facades. And this is a view of this uh, garden space with a downpipe that's both uh, acting as a downpipe to take water from the roof, but then also adding to the illusion of potentially being something structural, even though it's not structural. And these are these windows from the garden out to the laneway beyond. And then the facade, which is uh, unitized. So here where we have the double height space in the living room, it can be built up and then studded on the inside a bit like here. And these can then become windows as you see fit. But in the first instance, it's all it's like glazing, giving a specular, like uh, reflective type quality to the build. And I think I'm going to stop there because uh, I think otherwise I'll go on too long. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you so much. It was a really nice presentation about your work and uh, the way you got us through all the ideas and all in details and stuff. And I'm really fascinated about the fact that 
you were working with such tiny spaces, but you managed to kind of get all, I don't know, all the strategies to improve them and to make the people feel like they have like more space and create the um, relationship um, from inside to outside. And yeah, I think that's an amazing example of how can we use tiny spaces because usually architects, I mean, and maybe us, even as students, we're a bit like concerned when we have to work with small spaces. It's not the case this year because we have a huge site. <laughs> but but yeah, that's, that, that's actually amazing, like tiny houses, but taking the maximum of the space and from the inside to outside, that's, that's, that's surprising. And um, how did you came with the idea to use the water pipe as a, uh, an outside um, oh, element right. to, not, to not make it intrusive because usually installation feels a bit feel, feel, feels a bit an installation feels a bit intrusive for a project and sometimes architects usually want to kind of camouflage them and get rid yeah, of them but all you the just, time all the time yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you use them bold and nice to make it <laughs> in a really uh, interesting way I, I guess it's from from other influences looking at Bernard Labre and seeing how he was using things like garden hoses that people put away and hide in their garden sheds. But like, you know, once you do something deliberately and with purpose, you, I think even the very banal can become quite special. Uh, yeah, I, I, I get really sick of that modernist uh, conceit of, of trying to reduce things down to a minimal, mainly because it becomes very expensive. Like you asked, like we do very, we do very, uh, our clients are very ordinary clients. We don't have, uh, uh, we're not working with cultural institutions. We're, we're working with people on their homes. And coincidentally, not more than our choice, but you know, we, we they, to conceal a downpipe is a lot of expense for really what purpose. Uh, and, you know, I think that, you know, I'm, there's a kind of, uh, there's, I, I think, uh, a modernist belief that architecture is about the spatial arrangement or architecture is about the plan arrangement. And there isn't really uh, things like uh, m and &E or things that are applied onto architecture later on. If we had more time, I had another project where I would talk about that in more detail. But this idea, we are very interested in building sustainably in the office, but not as application of our brand onto a project, but building, we call it inherently sustainable. So like you're, we're using services uh, like PVs, not as applications, like you, you make your building, then you put PV panels onto it, but we're using PV panels as the actual fabric. So like the bricks of the building, how to make the PV become the fabric of the building. And it's the same with the downpipes, how to make the downpipes not just serve as, as, uh, as take the water off the roof, but become actually the architecture. You know, people are kind of interested in, it's a bit of a fashion for people to talk about like having columns that are architecture and the column may or may not hold up the building. But I'm much more interested in, in kind of things like, you know, like how uh, a light switch can be architecture, how a socket can be architecture, or how a downpipe can be architecture, and how you take these things not as like afterthoughts, but they're another layer, or they're another wash onto the building. And, you know, you often would see projects that might have a house that might be interesting. And then they have these things like the downpipe or the box gutter or the outlet that's just not thought of because it's not considered high. It's considered uh, it's considered something that's done by an engineer or it's considered something that's done by somebody else. And yeah. it's it's a lost opportunity, I think. Yeah, probably the, the best example I know with the whole installation from the hints out to outside is the Pompidou Center, but that's another story. It is still still amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, a great building. Like uh, it's funny, high tech architects are really out of fashion in the UK. And if we had more time, as I was just about to talk about my obsession with high tech high tech architecture, but uh, we well, that's another another time. But uh, it's it's uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy the optimism of the early British high tech. And uh, I guess people like uh, uh, Rogers and uh, and piano with the uh, Pompidou, and you know, using uh, standardized systems and using things that are you know thought of as like you know maybe low, and using them and how they assemble them, like this idea of richly economic, how they assemble them and how they elaborate them can make them special, and that's that's really what we're, what I'm interested in. Yeah, that's. That's very really nice though. And I wanted to ask what makes you 
choose certain materials to create the spaces. Are there any criteria or uh, materials? That... Yeah, it it depends. It, like lots of different factors. Like you know, uh, budget. Uh, what's local? What can we get access to without having to kind of import it in? I would say we generally don't have a, a fixed or a forced idea, and it, it come comes out a bit. Uh, uh, iteratively as we're moving through the project, uh, what do we want to convey with it? What's what should be the yeah the the uh, the atmosphere that it makes? All right, all right. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any question, as please let me know. Yeah. I didn't hear a question if there was a question there. Sorry? I, I didn't hear it. Was there a question there? I, I didn't hear it. No, I, yeah. I've asked okay. if anyone from the participants has any questions to ask. Sure. Let's wait. Mm -hmm. All right. If, if no, then I guess uh, that will be it and thank you so much for joining us once again no it was a really nice experience and personally i've learned a lot of things and i'm pretty sure the guys who attended as well and we're gonna upload the recording on our youtube channel so yeah thank you great thank you guys and uh yeah good luck with your uh, rest of the year and uh yeah i hope